So I think we've established so far that yes, we are being watched and we should be at least weary, if not, if not afraid. But even before we get to the issue of, of state surveillance, like cameras are ubiquitous in our lives. We're, we're used to seeing them everywhere, on, on the buses, train stations, traffic lights, movies, concerts, sporting events. In a way, their familiarity probably makes us less afraid of, of the possibility of being watched and being surveyed, um, being used against us. In the UK, which is I think known as the most um, watched country in the world, there's a, a surveillance camera for every 14 people. In the US, approximately 30 million surveillance cameras record up to 4 billion hours of footage every week. And it's not always a negative thing. So surveillance, um, as we know, played a role in catching the, the killer of, of Melbourne woman, Jill Ma, who was snatched from a public street. And cameras do play a role in keeping workers in vulnerable positions, convenience stores, petrol stations late at night, relatively safe. Um, but there is, you know, we all balk, we draw the line somewhere, we, we balk at the, the possibility of being watched in our own home. And I regard our online activity as, as part of our home. Um, that's where we draw the line. And I know Brendan's going to go into this a, a little more about how we still value our privacy, even though we do share a lot of things on, on social media. So I won't go into that too much, but I think the fact that we do care about our privacy really shows that the, the most visited and shared article in the, the history of the, the SMH, Sydney Morning Herald website, was a recent one about you know, the hacking of the, the celebrities, Jennifer Lawrence and Rihanna, etc., who had photos of them stolen, naked photos, and put on the internet. That, that story by, by a writer, Clementine Ford, was, had more than 2 million individual page views and was shared more than 170,000 times directly from the site. So this idea of having our privacy invaded through our, through our data, through, through our, our computers, is something that, that worries us all, I think. And yet privacy is something that we're all expected to increasingly give up. So when it comes to, to, data, to data retention, you know, this, this concept, this issue first came up you know, a couple of years ago through the, within the US where President Obama said that you know, that America needs to balance security and privacy. And our government is now, as we can see, clearly following suit. And while the new, you know, the proposed anti-terror legislation, the ASIO bill, is seen as a, as a targeting the Muslim community, and as someone who comes from that background, I can tell you they certainly feel like they're being watched and they are de definitely afraid. It has all of us on edge though, and we should all be, be worried about, about the implications. Um, and it has so many of us afraid that Australians are now flocking to, to virtual private networks that you know, give you a, a, a false um, IP address so that you can't be, be tracked down. Um, so one such network, Zenmate, saw an increase of 60% in the last three weeks of, of Australians going to VPNs, um, which is, interestingly, this, a similar number to what happened in Turkey when that country banned Twitter. So apologists for data retention will say, you know, we've all heard the mantra, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. As if, as if just going about your daily business and, and what websites you browse, how, you know, talking to your doctor or whoever, you know, you, you correspond with is, is someone else's business. Um, but of course, it doesn't go the other way. The government, even as the government is asking and expecting us to give up our privacy, they're becoming more secretive and is saying that it's essential to national security. So, you know, and our appalling treatment of asylum seekers, you know, Operation Sovereign Borders continues to operate under this, this cloak of, of secrecy and the government, you know, deliberately isolating vulnerable people away from the people and the prying eye of journalists and um, the safety of the law. And, you know, the government just recently, you know, doubled down on its, its position on, on Operation Sovereign Borders um, with, you know, Julie Bishop acting as Immigration Minister saying, you know, in accordance with the policy established by Operation Sovereign Borders Joint Agency Task Force Commander, the government will not provide commentary about on-water matters under Operation Sovereign Borders. And so that's what I really want to get into today. Is I'm concerned about the effects of government secrecy on democracy, probably even more than I'm concerned about our decreasing privacy. And that's mainly because of its, its effect on the media. So, you know, as we all know, a free press is absolutely essential to the function of a democracy. Um, in fact, uh, Michael Schutzen, who is a sociologist and has written extensively about the role of the media in, in, demo in democratic societies, goes as far as to say that the media is democracy. So, you know, the general perception most of us will have of democracy is mainly it's about voting. And as long as 
a, a population gets to vote and have their say, then they live in a democracy. But it is more complex than that. So you know, democracy works when people make informed decisions. And it's not enough to just have the right to vote. It's about having access to the information we need to make an informed decision so that we can make our vote count for us. So, you know, and how was the media, how people are meant to get informed is through the media. So the media needs to be, you know, unbeholden to political centres of power. And they must be allowed to operate freely and given access to government information. So Operation Sovereign Borders, where the government just point blank refuses to be transparent, transparent is a clear violation of the media's responsibility and right to inform. And to go back to their data retention laws, they're also dangerous for democracy, as we've already um, discussed, because they threaten the way that journalists can operate and making it harder for, for them to access whistleblowers or for whistleblowers to find someone to tell the story at the risk of ensnaring the journalists. So yeah, the media you know, cannot be stripped of this right to inform. It, it is absolutely vital to, to, to our democracy because then the media, and otherwise it just becomes a mouthpiece for the state. And that is dangerously close to what's happening with these, these terror raids this week. And I'll just quote here from The Guardian's Richard Ackland, who wrote a, a very important column on it. So I'll quote fairly extensively. So, we don't actually know the details of the evidence against the suspect. And because it is wrapped in the shroud of counter-terrorism, some of the proceedings against him will be in camera on the tenuous ground of national security. This could all have been achieved much more stealthily and proportionally, but that would have stripped the occasion of the opportunity for some serious theatre. The media were duly recruited and major mainstream TV outlets supplied with footage of the commando-style operations, filmed and supplied by the police themselves. The police also helpfully supplied still shots of the action to the newspapers. Most of the media laps this up with its ears back as willing pawns in the politics of terror drama, a readiness to be used by the very governments which go to extraordinary lengths to deprive journalists and the public of information. As British politician Anurin Bevan put it rather wonderfully when talking about Fleet Street, there is absolutely no need to muzzle sheep. <laughs> a great line. So still continuing Richard Ackland's words here, if a little scepticism was applied, Questions would be asked as to why we had this sudden splash of commando bombast when this particular group in Sydney had been under surveillance since May. Suddenly it is crystallised into the need for immediate action, no questions asked. So, speaking of muzzling sheep, when, when ABC newsreader Juanita Phillips reported on Twitter that there were claims of police brutality arising from the raids, she was immediately criticised by Shari Markson, who's the media editor at The Age, who tweeted back, ABC News' second story opened with claims of police brutality. Unreal. The AFP and New South Wales Police did a bloody good job today of keeping us safe. And to which um, Juanita Phillips replied back, smartly and correctly, the ABC doesn't make these claims. We need to explain why some people are protesting at Lakemba which is the role of the media, right? Not to, yeah. So, but what Shari Markson's tweet seems to be implying is the media shouldn't question the actions of the police or the government when it comes to these issues, national security, that, that our safety justifies any sort of action. And you know, we've seen this before, of course. So this, you know, this warped view that, that the idea of the media is, is basically stenographers and cheerleaders who, whose job is just to report what authorities say without challenging or even verifying it. So if you take your mind back to, to the announcement um, that the US military had killed Osama bin Laden in that covert operation in Pakistan and buried him at sea, you know, the Australian as well as the US media acted largely as a mouthpiece, just following every, every word of, of what Obama said. And remember, you know, his death was not witnessed by anyone other than the American operatives and their you know, mostly dead victims. It was relayed to the world in a shock announcement by the president who advanced the cause you know, of American exceptionalism by declaring America can do anything at once. And no trial. Uh, of course not. <laughs> and so, but it was still referred to as justice, right? Anyway, so the media re immediately reported the death as fact, sorry, even though it had occurred in the words of Crikey's Guy Rundle, in the, in the president's words and nowhere else. Now, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm not saying that he's not dead, that they didn't kill him. What I am saying is that the, government, the, the media's job is not just to report these things as fact, but to challenge where they can. That's the only way that we're going to know anything approximating the truth. Now, you know, most of us don't have sympathy for bin Laden, which is fair enough, but, but the, the, the idea is, is the bigger issue of what, what this means in the, in the wider context. It sets 
this dangerous precedent where the media doesn't exist to serve the public interest, but to serve, to serve the interest of, of the, you know, the, ruling, the ruling elite. And that is when our, our democracy is threatened. So I just want to finish off very briefly by relating this to the ag-gag laws, still you know, being pushed through in Australia, because what, that's just what I see as the government also transferring its right to secrecy to certain businesses and certain corporations. So if you're not familiar with the ag-gag laws, they're laws that will charge or that basically make it a crime to film any operations on um, animal agriculture farms or factory farms as they're called. So these, these businesses are already protected by trespass laws. So any activists trespassing will be you know, tried and have been tried under those laws. But these go further and that just says you, you basically point blank cannot film in these businesses, even if you're a worker there. So if you're a worker witnessing a fellow worker mistreating an animal and you shoot it on your iPhone, you could be charged under this law. And so what it does is it makes filming a crime a crime in itself. And we can maybe relate this back to that very first WikiLeaks video, the, um, which I've forgotten the name, of the name of the video, but the one, what was it? Collateral murder. The collateral murder. That's the, the one where, we, where it showed US soldiers in the Apache helicopter killing what was very clearly journalists and, and civilians. Who was, you know, who, who got the bigger punishment in that, in that scenario? Not the people that, were ki the, that, that killed innocent people, the people that filmed it and then all the people that leaked the video anyway to the public. So when the government is becoming increasingly more secretive and at the same time expecting us not to have any secrets, that's when I think it's clear that we do have a problem. So, you know, how real is our democracy? It, it is still real, but I don't think we need, you know, we should be resting on our laurels here. It's a lot more fragile um, than most or perhaps many of us are aware or would like to think. Thank you.